Good evening. Welcome to Cross Point Apostolic Center. I want to welcome you to, to, our, to our Mother's Day service. Today we're going to be covering an interesting topic, and it's going to be on, on an issue that, that some, some people from different camps, they, they, they take serious serious issue with this. And for, for good reason, that's understandable in many instances. Because in this issue, they, they seek to make biblical appeal. And the issue that I'm talking about is the issue on women preaching. Because today is a day where we, where we honor mothers. So as such, there are, many, there are many churches that they are allowing women to preach, mothers to, to, to preach, to exhort the congregation. So to some are teaching on, on, the, on, what, on, what a mother, on what a mother is supposed to do biblically, or an exhortation for, for women that desire to be mothers, or just general exhortation to the congregation regarding women. And there's many from different camps that they take offense to this. They think this is contrary to Scripture. Particularly the passage that, 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 is, that is often cited is 1 Timothy 2.12, where it says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. And this is not of the English Standard Version. And this is where we're going to keep our focus in today's messaging, is in 1 Timothy 2.12. So take this time, take your copy of God's Word, and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 12. We're going to be in, in this text for a majority of the sermon. Now before, before I begin this exhortation, and this exhortation will be to show the biblical premise for, for women preaching publicly, while also showing that the prohibition for women being pastors is true, but it doesn't prohibit them from preaching publicly. So before we, before we dive in, let's open up in a time of prayer. Father God, I thank you for your word. Father, I pray, O oh God, that you help me, Father, as I deliver your word, which is truth and life. Father, I pray, I pray O oh God, that you open the eyes, ears, and hearts, Father, of all those who hear this message, Father. That they may receive this truth, Father, that you desire to, to bring forth. And I pray grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right, so I want to read again 1 Timothy 2.12. It says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. So plain English reading of this appears to say that a woman can't teach or exercise authority. So most people, when they look at this, they say a woman can't teach, nor can she exercise authority over whom? Over a man. So they interpret that to mean that, that a woman cannot, can, cannot teach a man, nor can they exercise authority. So they highlight it as two things. There's two things, there's teaching, and then there's exercising authority. The problem with this is earlier manuscripts of this passage, it doesn't, it, where it says or teach, or to exercise authority, or day is what, the, is what the later Greek manuscripts use, which means or, but the earlier ones use the Greek word chi. Chi means and. So in the Greek, it says, I do not permit a woman to teach and to exercise authority. So this changes the meaning of the passage. This changes it from being two functions to one function. So teaching and authority is the same thing. So it's not teaching or authority, but it's teaching authority. So the focus is on teaching authority. And to understand, to understand what this means, we have to understand what is teaching authority. Because the presumption is that teaching authority is speaking of preaching to the congregation, exhorting the congregation. The problem with this view is this disqualifies historically a lot of pastors, a lot of bishops. Because in the early church, a bishop was not required to preach every Sunday. He could if he wanted to, but he wasn't obligated. It was the job of the presbyters. That they were the ones that were, that were required to preach every week with the bishop. They weren't required to preach every week, and they were overseers. And an overseer is not one who just pre preaches every Sunday. An overseer is a person that watches over the soul of a believer. And now we're going to say that the, that the, the preaching on Sundays is the watching over of the souls. And that's to be dishonest to even the core of discipleship because discipleship is culminated not in the messages every Sunday, even though the messages every Sunday are helpful and they help us grow and they're the, they're the food that we need, that we need to encourage us and remind us what Jesus did. But true discipleship and true growth and progress in the faith comes when a pastor is one-on-one -on -one with people. 
when he is in community with the people that are in his circle, when he is in, when he is involved in the lives of his people, this is what an overseer is. And this is why the pastor's job is a difficult job. Because especially if you've got a bigger church, you've got a bigger church, you've got more people you need to be connected with. So if teaching authority was to reflect, well, there was to reflect preaching, then there would be a lot of pastors historically that wouldn't meet the criteria of the pastorate. But since we see that, that, that historically there's a different understanding of teaching authority, we then have to dive in with what does scripture say? The history attests to this. What is the biblical, biblical ground scripturally? We see the authority given to the apostles in Matthew 16, 19. It says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then in John 20, 23, in the commissioning, the commissioning of the apostles after Jesus rose from the grave, he said, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Both of these are from the ESV. So in first, looking in Matthew 16, 19, Jesus is telling Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So the, the pastor, the, the pastor there given the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? Be given the keys of the kingdom of heaven. This can only be understood in its rabbinical sense because the Jews of this day, when they looked at the kingdom of heaven, their understanding of the kingdom of heaven was the Torah. The Torah is what gave light to the revelation of God, is what gave light to the kingdom of God. So to us, the scripture is the kingdom of heaven. And the keys, the keys is speaking of the understanding. So Jesus, when he's speaking to Peter, he's saying, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Saying, I will give you understanding to the kingdom of God. I will give you understanding to scripture. So the first authority, the first authority that, that, that's seen in what is constituted as teaching authority is first the interpretation of the word of God. We see this in where he says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So this phrase, binding and loosing, this was rabbinic terminology, which related to the interpretation of the law. The rabbis, when teaching of binding and loosing, they taught binding was to hold to a strict interpretation, whereas loosing was to loosen the text to allow for applications. Secondly, in dealing with binding and loosing, the second authority seen within the relation to church discipline. We see his language used again in Matthew 18, dealing with disciplining, disciplining people that ear. And the third authority, which we see in John 20, 23, where it says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. This is a hard, this is a hard passage to interpret that oftentimes, that oftentimes gets either overlooked or misunderstood. But it's clear that if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. This is the authority given to the, to the 11. Because of Judas, Judas hung himself, so the 12, 12 didn't come in until, until the, <clears throat> until Acts. So what does it mean if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven? This isn't saying that they have power to forgive sins because only God alone can forgive sins. But what, rather what it's speaking of, it's speaking of admitting people into the church or preventing people from coming into the church on account of demonstrating true, genuine repentance. Furthermore, the apostles and, the, and their successors, in, in showing that they didn't possess power to forgive sin, they rather recognize the fruit in accordance with repentance. This is to say the one who has authority is the one who has discernment on whom God has forgiven and who God hasn't. So to put it, so, so to put it one way, the scripture, the scripture gives an overview. Or what are the signs of a repentant heart? What is the signs that a person has truly embraced the Savior? What is the, what is the evidence that a person truly has embraced Christ as Lord Jesus, as Lord and Savior? And the and the pastor, and the pastor, or the bishop, or what, whatever, whatever title your particular tradition holds that whatever is the leader within the house that you are in, this is the one that is that, that, that they, have, they have such a rich knowledge of the word of God. They have such a rich understanding of the context of scripture that when people come into the, come into the church as visitors and they say, I have professed Jesus as Lord, that you're able to determine 
has this person genuinely embraced the Savior based on a conversation? Oftentimes in today's church culture, we think that what it means to be a Christian is to just say, I believe in Christ. But the issue with this is even the demons know that Jesus is the Christ. So it's more than just professing with your mouth that Jesus is Christ. Now, yes, the scripture says, call upon his name and you'll be saved. But true faith, true belief accompanies good works. True faith accompanies a contrite heart, a desire for the things of God. That isn't to say you're going to have a perfect walk. That isn't going to say that you're not going to fall short. That isn't saying that. But it's saying you're going to have an earnest desire for the things of God. You're going to have an earnest desire for, for reading the word. You're going to have an earnest desire for prayer, an earnest desire to join covenantal community. We have oftentimes people that are Christians that they want to forsake the gathering. How can you be a Christian but yet forsake the gathering? Because it's in the gathering that, that, we, that we picture that we picture Christ. That we are picture Christ and we proclaim Christ. The gathering is important. Communion is important. Prayer is important. The studying of scripture is important. All of these things are important. And these are the predications of, of the evidences of what it means to be a Christian. And, the, and the, the pastors, they are the ones that because of their broad knowledge of scripture, they're able to discern the person, if the person is genuinely a Christian. And upon their confession, and upon the, the clear evidence, of, which is simplifying the contrite of heart and earnest desire for the things of God, they are admitted into the church community, baptized, and baptized, becoming officially a member of the physical church. This sermon is based off the pastor through knowledge of the word of God. And so then when it talks about, when it talks about if you forget the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. This is further, this is further. The, the, the pastor recognizing who God has forgiven. The one whom God has forgiven is the one whom Christ's righteousness was imputed on through faith. But the one whom God has not forgiven is the one whom Christ's righteousness was not imputed on. Because of that person's unbelief. This is a dividing line. And this is why it's necessary for pastors to be pastors. Because we are the ones, we are the ones that are dutied and entrusted with discerning. Who is the one whose Christ righteous is imputed on through faith? And who is the one who Christ righteous is not imputed on because of that person's unbelief? Look at the key word. Unbelief. Your unbelief is what evidences that you are unconverted. And I'm saying unbelief, not lack of faith. Because that's a common thing that's assaulted to where people have stripped unbelief of what it means. Unbelief doesn't mean I have doubts sometimes of is God gonna is God gonna provide for me? Is is God it, does God really love me? These are things that the babe deals with. Unbelief is different than little faith. Unbelief is I reject Christ. That is unbelief. It is impossible for somebody to be a Christian to reject Christ. And now there's a lot of Christians who say, I don't reject Christ. But if you but if you reject, but if you reject the finished work of Christ, then you add works onto the message of the cross. Something for you, something for you to gain, believing in the Son, apart from being saved from the wrath of God. Then you ear, you ear, and you have unbelief. Because true belief is Jesus died for me on the cross. He died for sin so that I could have a pathway to salvation be delivered from the wrath of God. I'm not entitled to anything. We're not entitled. We're not entitled to a blessed life. Well, we, we are not entitled to anything because what Christ did was sufficient and it's enough. There's nothing that needs to be added on it. We are children of God and that's enough. We're saved from the day of his wrath and that's sufficient. We can have joy and we can rejoice because we're not no longer under condemnation. We're no longer bound to, 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 live, to live according to the desires of the flesh. But now we're bound as bond servants to righteousness, bond servants to Christ. What a joy to go from a slave of sin to a slave of righteousness. If that doesn't bring joy in your heart, then you don't know the Savior. If it doesn't excite you and entice you to live righteously, to know that you are a servant of the living God, then you are still dead in your sins. You're still dead in your sins. Because only the person who is dying to sin, hates sin, and loves righteousness, and, and seeks earnestly 
the things of God. But this is why it's so important for there to be a, a sense of teaching authority. Because the teaching authority, those who are in these positions, they're the ones who circumvent the terrors who come into the church. They're the ones who circumvent these people that come masquerading as people who are justified by faith. But in all actuality, they're seeking a justification by works. They're seeking Christ to amplify their own wicked works, their own vain imagination, their own dreams. But that's not the gospel. The gospel is Jesus died for you so you can be saved from the wrath of God. It's not Jesus died. Jesus died for you so he has a plan for your life. The only plan that God has for your life is to save your soul. Jesus didn't die so we can have the maximal life now. Jesus died so we can have the maximal eternity. So we can suffer all things in this life. We can lose all things. But we can still have joy because our confidence and our hope is not in this life, but in the life to come. You know, that doesn't mean that God doesn't give providence. It doesn't mean that he gives us providence. He gives us gifts, for example, to the one, to the one who works diligently. They're able to benefit from the fruit of their labor. There, there are certain promises that God gives. God gives promises for, 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 for his spouse. These are promises. These are blessings from God. God gives us blessings in this, in this life. But we are not to have a life that's fixated on the blessings. Our life should be fixated on what Christ did on the cross. Yes, he's a good father. That doesn't mean he's a sugar daddy. We need to stop treating him like that. Like he's our piggy bank. He's our ATM. Anytime we just want to, anytime we just want to withdraw. No. No, that's a mockery to the gospel. Jesus paid it all for, for you and me. He paid it all. Believe in the Son. And serve him with all your heart out of genuine love. Just in the same way he went on that cross because of genuine love. And this is why there's such importance. Because without the position of teaching authority, there would be nothing to circumvent tares. There would be nothing to protect the flock. There would be nothing to help, help, help the true sheep grow in their faith. Be built up. Think about a sheep without a shepherd. A sheep without a shepherd, their wool is going to get too heavy. And if anybody's seen a video of how sheep are when they don't get sheared, it, the, the, the wool covers them and it's hard for them to walk and they can develop infections and it can weigh them down and it can get them sick. The sheep need a shepherd. Because without the shepherd, there is nobody to shear the wool. There's no one to feed it properly and to make sure it's properly maintenance. This is the job of the person that is in the position of teaching authority. And this is why God set up a system like this. And so this teaching authority, it differs from teaching, which, will, which as we continue on, we'll see the differentiation. To better personify teaching authority, it's not found in preaching, rather than admitting the saints into church membership, excommunicating those who hear, and rightly teaching the word of truth. This is what Jesus, this is what Jesus gave the authority to the apostles to do. He gave them the authority to be the to be the authorizers of who is accepted into the physical church. Excommunicating those who, who ear, who sin in a grievous way, and who rightly teach the word of truth and say, This is the faith that is delivered once and for all. This is the right interpretation. This is what teaching authority is. Now, people take that and then apply that to teaching, but what, as we're going to see, there's a difference between teaching and teaching authority. Consider Romans 12, 6 through 8. Where it says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them in prophecy in proportion to our faith, in service and our serving. The one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So then in Romans 12, 6 through 8, it starts off saying there's gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. And it says, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith. But then in verse 7, it says, the one who teaches and teaches. So this is given to the general congregation. First Timothy 2 12 is dealing with leadership. But then Romans 12 is showing to the general, con the general congregation. So then that means that there must be a difference between teaching authority and teaching. Further, the context of Romans 12 is in the public gathering. So this is so the so the minutes of the exercise of the gifts 
They weren't happening outside of the gathering. They were happening in the gathering. Also, there, also there is no indication of the giving of the gift being gender neutral. So if women, so First Timothy twelve, First Timothy two twelve applies to women publicly preaching and publicly teaching, then you would have to then present the case in Romans 12, 12, 7, well, 6 and 7, because you've got prophecy and teaching. You would have to present a case of where there is gender, where, where there is gender exclusion. Where there's gender exclusion in this text. There is no gender exclusion. This is a general, this is a general thing that is given. To all people, the scripture even foreshadows such a working of the spirit to where gifts would be given to men and women alike. See that in Joel chapter 2, verse 28, where it says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Remember that, all flesh. Your sons and your daughters, your sons and your daughters, shall what? Prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. So a person shall come to pass, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So the promise of the spirit was on all who believe, all. And then it, and then it goes further by saying, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. So this is, this is not showing a gender exclusion. This is showing that men, men, male and female alike shall prophesy. This is an interesting thing because under the old covenant, prophecy, dreaming, and seers, which is what we see in, in the next line, that your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions, these were gifts given only to a select few within Israel. And these people to, to whom these gifts were given, they were called prophets, which was a special title under the Old Covenant relating to them being in communion with God in the sense they can hear God and deliver messages on his behalf. But then when we look at this passage, it says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and they will prophesy. So this is to foreshadow the work of the Holy Spirit to make us all prophets, not in the office sense, but in the, but in the sense that we now are all speaking on behalf of God. Anybody who's in Christ, they have revelation of the gospel, they have revelation of the word of God, and they are commissioned to be, to be delegated to the word of God and to declare the word of God as prophets. Under the new covenant, we are all prophets without gender exclusion. We see this then in 1 Corinthians 14, 24, where it says, But if all prophesy, and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to, he is called to account by all. So notice it says, if all prophesy. All. Again, we don't see gender exclusion. All means all. All doesn't mean all male. It means all, male and female. And it is a statement reflected all the believers prophesying by speaking the word one to another. That is the meaning of prophecy. When it says, but if all prophesy, this isn't talking about people going out and doing fortune telling prophecy. That's not the context of, the, of prophecy. Prophecy in this context of Greek prophetia, it, me, it means to declare, divine, to declare something by divine revelation. So this is speaking of the function of every Christian in the body. We are called to declare divine revelation. And then in 1 Corinthians 14, 26, Paul then says, What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. So notice, notice it says, when you come together, again, talking about the gathering, the public gathering, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. This sounds like teaching. And it says each one reflects all teaching, which was not gender exclusion. And it was for what? To let all things be done for building up. That is, it is to be for edification. So if there's prohibition for women to preach publicly and teach publicly, why are they, why are their gifts 
given, teaching gifts given to male and female like in the gathering. The operation is occurring in the gathering. We then see in 1 Peter 4.10, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. So then the Apostle Peter, he said that each has received a gift. Use it to serve one another. So we see in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, we haven't gone through 12, 13, 14, but the gifts are also highlighted in that. In both those contexts, context, it's in relation to a public gathering. And so we see with, with prophecy, we see women have, have the permission to prophesy because we all are prophets. Or are we then going to negate the word of God and say only men are prophets, but women are prophets, even though Joel chapter 2.28 foreshadowed the church, foreshadowed the church where the Holy Spirit would dwell in us and we would all be spokespersons for God. And the spokes and the, and the message that we proclaim is the gospel. That is the message of redemption and the message of hope. And then we see another gift, this teaching. The Apostle Peter says that each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. Romans 12, 7 says that one of the gifts is teaching. So if a woman is given the gift of teaching, which there's no indication that it's gender exclusive to where only a male gets a teaching gift, that they are not to teach in the public gathering, as Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 show, that they are not being good stewards of God's very grace. This is to say the one with the gift of teaching is to teach in the context of the public gathering. And to, cl and to, and to close the, the, the thought, to go back to 1 Timothy 2, 12. Look at the last part. It says, rather, she is to remain quiet. This passage is what people harp on, to where they say that the woman is to be silent. The woman is not to speak in the public gathering. But that's on the plain English reading of the text. When you look at the Greek for quiet, it speaks of harmony. When it talks about silence, women be silent. Which it says it also in 1 Corinthians 14. Which I encourage you for homework to, to, to do, a, do an honest study of 1 Corinthians 14. Because a lot of people harp on verse 34 to where it talks about, in 1 Corinthians 14, where it talks about women to be silent. But if you look at 30, men are told to be silent first. So the men are told to be silent, and the women are told to be silent. So there's a deeper meaning to it. So what does it mean to be silent and quiet? The Greek doesn't reflect the, the, the sense of quietness that the English would reflect of just like base silence, but it speaks of harmony. So when it says she has to remain quiet, she has to remain silent. This is to say she has to remain, remain in harmony with the doctrine of the apostles, which is the doctrine of the church. What the apostles taught is a settled matter. It is a faith delivered once and for all unto the saints. And, and the woman is not permit, and what it says, I do not permit a woman to teach her to exercise authority over a man. Yes, this is true in the sense that a woman is not permitted to have teaching authority. Because then we see later on, then we see later on Paul's defense in, in verse 13 and 14. He makes an appeal to creation. That this is found contrary to even creation. Because Adam was created first and Adam was given the law of God and then Eve was created to be a helper to man. So woman is not to have teaching authority and what it says to remain quiet, to remain in harmony to the doctrine of the apostles. And the doctrine of the apostles is biblical headship. The doctrine of the apostles is a complementarian view to where when it comes down to the role of a pastor, that it is male exclusive. But preaching and teaching in the public congregation is not in violation of 1 Timothy 2.12. That is a presumption that what it means to, to yeah, teaching authority is to preach. The scripture doesn't show that. History doesn't show that. Only the modern church views teaching authority as reflecting of preaching. Preaching is good. Preaching is something that a pastor is encouraged to do. Now, this isn't to say that every single person who wants to preach should be able to preach. No. The person that is permitted to preach and teach in the gathering is the one that is approved by 
God. And when I mean approved by God, I don't mean approved by God in the ministerial sense, but I mean in the fellowship sense. Because when you are recognized as a member of the of the local church, you are recognized as knowing all core doctrines. And the reason why this is such a divisive topic is because you have churches that ear and that they're knitting people into their church service, into their church membership. I mean, not church service, into their church membership on account of them going to a class that talks about the history of the church, the local church, not the history of of, of the apostolic church, of the, of the church of our Lord and Savior, the church that he established 2,000 years ago. Membership should not be this so. People who are admitted into membership and who are baptized are to, be, are to be rooted in all core doctrines of the faith. They are to be rooted in firm knowledge and understanding of the deity of Christ, of redemption, of the Trinity, of the nature of God, the nature of the Holy Spirit. You cannot be enjoined to the body of Christ if, you, if you're serving a Jesus you don't even know. We need, we need Christians that know the gospel. We need Christians that know who Christ is. How can we proclaim somebody we don't know? And so my prayer is that in this short exhortation, that, that I'm providing an adequate defense to show, yes, women are not permitted to, to be pastors over a church, but that doesn't mean that they don't have permission to preach publicly or teach publicly. So I'd like to close us in a time of prayer. Father God, I thank you, Father, for, the, for your word, Father, the truth and life. Father, I pray, oh God, that you help those who have heard this message to receive this message, Father, to see the clarity that is found in your word pertaining this divisive issue that some people make it out to me, Father. And Father, I pray, Father, from this message, Father, that you may bring a sense of unity, Father, that we may see, that we may see all members of the body fulfill the ministry of, of prophesying, of teaching as your word declares, not in the fortune-telling sense, but in sharing the gospel one with another, Father. And Father, I pray grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.